Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around it's Science Fiction Saturday again and I'm doing a couple of English science fiction movies. One from 1949, one from 1954, both of which were based on stage plays, which is a little bit unusual for the genre, but they're fun. One of them is very well known, the other one's a little more obscure. So we're going to start with the obscure one. Switch on, will you, Mrs. Butters? Thank you. 1949's The Perfect Woman, starring Nigel Patrick, Patricia Rock, Stanley Holloway, Irene Handel, and it's a hoot. It's a lot of fun. It's got a robot in it, so it's science fiction. And it's a little bit mad. A scientist called Professor Bellman, played by Miles Mallison. A kind of dithery character actor. Miles Mallison was in First Men in the Moon, playing the dithery old Clark, who finds the information about Arnold Bedford in the frame story. And in this one, he plays a scientist who creates a female robot who is based on his niece, Penelope, played by Patricia Rock. Now, the robot isn't played by the same actress, so they don't do the split-screen thing. The robot's played by an actress called Pamela Devis, and she never gets to do any talking in the movie. But she does get to do some of the physical comedy. So Professor Bellman decides he needs to test out the robot. He needs somebody to take the robot out on the town and take her out for, to nightclubs and things. Here's a housekeeper called Mrs. Butters, also known as Buttercup, played by the wonderful Irene Handel. So Penelope and Buttercup go out to buy clothing for this robot on this planned trip that the professor wants to do to test the ability for the robot to function in society. He hires a kind of ne'er-do-well, lazy, upper-class guy called Roger Cavendish, played by Nigel Patrick, who has a butler called Ramshead, played by Stanley Holloway who gets all the best lines in the movie. So Cavendish and Ramset end up looking after the robot for a week and testing it out. They take it to a posh hotel. The only room available is a bridal suite, which leads to complications. Cavendish needs to get some money from his aunt because his aunt's cut him off from his inheritance. But what they don't know is that Penelope has had a date cancelled with a, a guy she wanted to go out with. And so Buttercup suggests to her that she replace herself with the robot. And so she does. The robot stays at home. Penelope pretends to be the robot. It's one of the weirdest meet-cute moments you see in a movie. The woman is pretending to be a robot. The guy thinks she's a robot. There is a certain instruction set that Cavendish and Ramsey are given, which enables them to give vo vocal commands to move the robot around. And she's got to follow that. And things are unfortunate for Penelope. She's stuck in the back of the convertible during the rain when they travel to the hotel, so she gets freezing cold and wet. She doesn't get to eat any of the food because the guys are pretending that she's real to everybody around them. And so they eat all her food surreptitiously, and she has a pretty bad time of it. And meanwhile, the aunt arrives at the hotel. Knowing that Cavendish is in the bridal suite, she assumes that he has married Penelope masquerading as a robot. And things get weird from there. You brazen... <laughs> There's also a comedy subtext with a couple of people in the hotel. The Mater D, played by an actor called Fred Berger, and his sidekick Wolfgang Winkle, played by an actor called David Hurst, who's on his first day on the job and has some real conniptions. This is kind of a comedy of matters. It's a little bit like a French farce with a science fiction twist. There's not really anything egregious in this one. It's, it's a kind of cute 1940s screwball comedy with that science fiction angle. It was based on a stage play by Basil Mitchell and Wallace Jeffrey, which was quite successful. It was a kind of light play. But screwball comedies after the war were quite popular in the theatre. People wanted to forget all the recent unpleasantness as much as they could. And so a lot of these comedies did really well. And they were the sort of comedies that could travel around the country with different repertory companies to do them. Stanley Holloway playing the butler gets a lot of the slyest, best lines. Patricia Rock is fantastic with the physical comedy and also doing the side glances when she thinks nobody's looking at her. Nigel Patrick, who always played cads in movies, does quite well as Cavendish. Younger Irene Handel. This is decades and decades before she was playing Grandma in Metal Mickey. 
or was playing Benny Hill's sister in the Italian job gets some really good lines playing the housekeeper Miles Mallison playing the professor as his usual dither himself didn't stretch himself much to play this character but he does get a few good lines in it's witty it's charming it's silly the science fiction aspect fortunately for this channel is at the core of the conceit and the comedy revolves around thinking a woman is a robot and then bringing the robot into the picture and it's both kind of light-hearted and kind-hearted which makes it a really fun film to watch now patricia rock had a little bit of a career in hollywood and then came back to england in the 1940s went to france and made two pictures including the man in the awful tower with burgess meredith and then came back and made the perfect woman while she was in hollywood and this is the only thing i could think of, this is the only thing i can find negative about her she had an affair with ronald reagan which shows from my point of view a singular lack of taste because he had the charisma of dry white toast but nonetheless she stopped acting and went on to be successful in other areas she married well and lived a long and happy life but she was very good in this kind of comedy she really plays it well she's got a tremendous on-screen charisma and of course you have to lift your game when you're playing against such seasoned thespians as miles mallison and nigel patrick and stanley holloway and irene Handel. you've got to hold your own in that kind of a ensemble and she does it really really well this is a charming film it's a lot of fun it's light science fiction but it's science fiction from a time when there weren't a lot of science fiction movies being made and the ones that were were often quite ordinary but for me this one worked i like it i'll watch it again i just like the way the characters play off one another and the bit where the robot goes berserk at the end is quite amusing as well in fact it was so popular that in 1956 the bbc did a live adaptation of the same play on television and after the film was made patricia rock went off and married the cameraman a guy called andre thomas and they got married in paris so happily ever after fun little science fiction movie that then takes us to the second movie the one you are here to hear about and that is 1954's devil girl from mars with patricia laffin hugh mcdermott adrian corey hazel court peter reynolds and also joseph tamelty who has got an interesting connection to modern music devil girl from mars is an crazily popular film mostly for the fetishistic aspects of the main character naya played by patricia laffin the mini skirt and the cape and the skull cap and the whole look screams rubber fetish that's possibly why the movie has retained a fan following for almost 70 years now patricia laffin plays a character called naya who comes from mars to search for men because there's been a gender war on mars and and the potency of the men has decreased so she is sent from mars to earth to pick up some guys and use them for the necessary perpetuation of the martian race her spaceship which is very groovy looking is clipped by a meteorite and crashes into a moor in the scottish hebrides and not too far away from a small inn called the bonnie charlie a group of people are at the inn there's a professor played by joseph tamelty there's a journalist played by hugh mcdermott who was an interesting actor as well he started out as a professional golfer and then went into acting there's a fashion model called ellen played by hazel court who's got a little bit of backstory there's a an escaped convict played by peter reynolds the barmaid doris is played by adrian corey who you might remember was the woman in the red jumpsuit who was attacked by the droogs in the clockwork orange and she was also the head of the vampire circus in the hammer movie vampire circus we also get john laurie who was in dad's army very very well-known scottish actor playing the publican and he gets to do not too much business but a little bit so the red hot flying saucer lands in the moors near the inn and slowly cools down and when it does naya played by patricia laffin comes out of the spaceship with her ray gun and starts making demands she's put a force field around the inn and around the spaceship she's got a giant robot called chani who disintegrates things and is kind of like a scottish english wannabe gort from the day the earth stood still doesn't look as good it looks like an electric shaver with legs but it kind of works in context 
And Patricia Luffin really sells a cold, stony, dominant Naya in a really interesting way. Patricia Laffer was in a few movies. She was in Quo Vadis and did a really nice job there as a queen. And she was an actress who was not amenable to the male sex, let's say. She was more Agnes Moorhead than Marilyn Monroe, if you know what I mean. Hazel Court is really good playing Ellen. She gets to have some really nice plot beats there. Adrian Corey doesn't get a lot to do in this one, but does it quite well. And Joseph Tamelti as the professor is an interesting character. He was an Irish actor who was also the first father-in-law of Sting. His daughter married Sting, and then they divorced later on. So you can watch this movie and go, yep, there is Sting's father-in-law, which is weird and shows in some ways how incestuous the entertainment community in England is and was. The movie was made by a pair of brothers called Edward and Harry Danzinger, who made a lot of movies between the early 50s and the mid-1960s in the UK. They did any genre. They had $70,000 to make any movie they decided to make. So that was their budget for any film. If they hired a studio, then they'd rush the second movie into production if they still had a week or so left on the rent in that studio. They did all sorts of things. They did horror movies. They did a couple of science fiction movies. They did a lot of crime films. They also made a nudist film called Pussycat's Paradise in 1960, which is one of the first well-regarded nudist films. So the Danzingers did a lot of things, and in Devil Girl from Mars, they really punched the game up. There's a great scene right at the end where the spaceship is flying away from the survivors of their encounter with Naya, and one of their characters is on board and is going to sabotage the spaceship. And you see it dwindling in the sky in the distance, and then you get a really nice explosion effect done with a cloud chamber, which works really well. It's kind of a low-budget way of doing it, but it gives it a distinctive look. And the model work for the spaceship is great, but people love this movie, and I think part of it is that fetish aspect. People who are, I mean, I've got no problem with people's kinks. Do what you like as long as you don't hurt somebody else. But the Patricia Luffin character's costume, which I think was designed by a guy called John Sutcliffe, looks really good and gives her an upper-class scary look as well as being rubber fetish material. And I'm sure any number of fetishists in subsequent decades have asked for that costume to be made for their own purposes. And the argument's been made as well that this movie running a year or so after the day the Earth stood still is a mirror image of that movie in some ways. In The Day the Earth Stood Still, Klaatu is a Christ-like figure, Mr. Carpenter. And then we've got Naya, who is very much an evil character and a devil-like character, and a female as well. She's not on Earth to help Earth people. She's here to harvest our men. And so there's an interesting mirror image between those two films, which I think works well. They'd they make a lovely double feature, I think. They the should still first, and then Devil Girl from Mars. Yeah, the production values are totally different there. Made by two different cultures with two different budgets. They are thematically linked in some interesting ways, and you can compare and contrast them if you're so inclined. Now, of course, it was all shot on sound stages rather than on locations. So even though it is set on a sound stage, they're quite roomy-looking sound stages. And the shots of the spaceship in particular show that there's a particularly good scale for the set for the external part of the spaceship. The internal parts owe a lot to the day the Earth stood still, with the indirect lighting and the kind of shadowy look of the inside of the spaceship, and the very austere Art Deco look at the inside of the spaceship. Oddly enough, the sound editor on Devil Girl from Mars was Jerry Anderson, who later went on to do a lot of his own work, of course, in science fiction as a genre. Now, the play the movie was based on was by James Eastwood and John C. Ma. And again, it was a quite a successful play of its time. And even though the movie was low budget, there were some good practical effects. It was fully automated and broke down a lot, but still it was fully automated so they could make it at a scale that was too big to fit a person into. And I think, that, again, that's a bold move to do. They didn't get rid of having a tall actor or a tall bouncer, in the case of the Daddy Earth, still in a rubber suit. They made the suit 
physically and automated it, even though it broke down a lot. Robotic technology wasn't that good in 1954, but I think it works. Even though the front end of the film is loaded with character development as the people get together in the end and start talking to each other, and you've got the problem of Peter Reynolds' character being an escaped convict and, and his girlfriend being Doris, you've got the romantic cute between Ellen and the journalist played by Hugh McDermott, You've got the professor wondering what thing, what's happening. You've got a kid who's the child of the family who run the inn. All of that character development, so you actually care about the people when stuff starts getting real, works. But it does show the stage origins of the story. Now, Peter Reynolds, I mentioned him before. He played spivs and, and dubious characters at various times in his career in England. In 1969, he moved to Sydney and became an actor here and turned up in a lot of things. He was very successful in a whole bunch of television commercials for Wild Woodbine Cigarettes, where he played a kind of Victorian gentleman touting these cigarettes back when cigarette ads were able to be on television. Really popular, sold a lot of cigarettes. And then in 1975, Peter Reynolds was in his flat in Oxford Street in Paddington, where he fell asleep with a cigarette in his hand and he died of the fire and his little dog died with him and then they stopped putting those ads on television and the cigarette brand died out a bit of a sad end to his life but people of a certain age here in australia would instantly recognize the face and instantly recognize the work he did in things like tv series like number 96 and some of the crawford crime tv series of the time but devil go for mars works it's fun it's light it does a lot with very little, and that ensemble cast with people like Hazel Court and Adrian Corey in it, and Patricia Luffin, really lifts the game in the same way that the ensemble in The Perfect Woman lifts the game. Uh, Hazel Court said it was like being in a repertory theatre when they were making the movie, because all the actors were playing off against each other and bringing their A game to not feature themselves but to improve the story. And I like that kind of approach. I like the fact that a movie like this, which has a cult reputation, was made in a very congenial environment. I think I'm more kind towards movies where the people making them had a good time instead of the people making them having a monstrous time and half of them are assholes and half of them are being monstered by the assholes. These two movies, both based on plays, both from the UK, both doing a lot with a little, being very entertaining on fairly low budgets, were a joy to rewatch. They were really fun, really interesting, low stake science fiction, but quality science fiction nonetheless. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the notification bell. You can also support the channel by becoming a channel member, or you can donate through Patreon at patreon.com slash Terry Talks Movies. On the Monday video, which is also a Sunday video if you're in some parts of the world, I've got another horror double feature that featured in a cinema. And then on Wednesday, hopefully, I'll get some Umbrella Entertainment new releases to review and show to you. So until all of that happens, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies, watch some low-budget science fiction movies from odd times in the past. You'll enjoy them, and I'll catch you next time.